Um, thank you everyone so much for coming. Thank you so much to Dr. Sushet for making the way um, from Germany today. I'm really excited. Got to hear speak at a event in the fall about Cold Adams um, with Pascal. And um, he's also going to speak about his postdoctoral research. Um, and, but very excited to have him back in Quebec for the last six months. And before that, um, completed his PhD as well as postdoctoral research in um, the States. So um, we're lucky to have him here today and, um, and to listen and ask questions after and discuss. So uh, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, yeah, I'm super happy to be here. It's nice. Uh, Sherbrooke is only two hours away from, from Montreal. So, you know, it's early, you know, early morning and then a bus ride. And that's good. So today I'd like to talk about simulating spin systems using programmable quantum simulators. First part of the talk, I'm going to talk about work I've done last year at my postdoc in Rutgers University in New Jersey, where I investigated the Kagome lattice on the waves quantum computer. And the second part, I'll kind of expand on that and say, okay, but like if we can simulate well quantum spin systems, is that a useful resource for some computational tasks? What can we do with that? And kind of maybe segue a little bit into my recent works on two neutral atoms. And kind of want to say a caveat, currently employed by both Pascal and the University of Sherbrooke in kind of an interesting arrangement as a researcher and a trainer. But the views presented here on the wave are only mine and not the ones of Pascal. Um, and so without further ado, let's um, make sure that the clicker works. Always, kind of, there we go. Um, so like I said, I'm going to talk about all of these different things. Uh, so the beginning, let me introduce a little bit uh, first-rate spin systems. I mean, this is an RQMP seminar, so you guys probably have learned a lot about first-rate spin systems over the years. Um, so very quick review on first-rate spin systems. The basic unit for frustration in magnetic systems is the triangle, where I try to satisfy anti-ferromagnetic interactions. So really, it's kind of a quest to anti align which can never be satisfied. So you're in this unending quest to just completely always try to satisfy this, but it never happens. And in real systems, what this means is that at low temperature, there's this lack of typical order, and it leads to a lot of uh, quantum fluctuation that can lead to new... This, this picker is not really... Okay, there we go. I got a be like flip kind of close by. Okay. It leads to new conventional magnetic orders. <laughs> there's like a delay. There you go, okay. A lack of conventional magnetic order. So let's say you wanted, you were expecting a ferromagnet or an anti-ferromagnet with a nail checkerboard face. And well, lo and behold, you don't find that. You find some, okay, maybe some tented ferromagnet or some interesting 120 degree order. That's not too bad, but in some cases it leads to really exotic spin systems and spin, uh, like uh, ground states, um, such as like quantum spin liquids and topological spin liquids, right? And so um, one of some of the ones I want to emphasize here are spin ice and spin liquids. Um, so some famous examples from the materials point of view are these different organic compounds here, uh, which like form basically 2D sheets of effectively triangular lattices with spin one half residing at each of the sites. You could also, you know, effective uh, uh, catalogue lattices. So the blue sites here are going to be the magnetic sites. The effective category lattices that are going to be in the plane, and you're going to have the fam now famous alpha lithium trichloride, which is an hexagonal lattice and is one of the candidates for a Kitev spin liquid. Although um, much of the experimental investigation in recent years has kind of made that claim disappear a little bit. Um, and on the theoretical side, you've got these famous models like Kitev's um, hexagonal um, spin liquid, which has these very strange kind of XX, YY, and ZZ interactions. Um, and as you tune these different interactions, you have a gap and a gap less spin liquid with some Majorana zero modes and very interesting features. Um, I have mentioned spin ice because that's been a very, for me, a very formative thing. It's the first problem I worked on in kind of condensed matter physics uh, 10 years ago. Um, and spin ice is very interesting because, well, lack of even classical order continues all the way down to the lower temperature. And you have these emergent magnetic monopoles that uh, exist in, this, in the system that can move around and you have these very interesting strings that go on and these magnetic monopoles can seem to be deconfined at low temperature. Um, and in general, these, these different spin liquids or the different states that you would find at low temperature 
present emergent fractionalized excitation, or even just um, in the language of, of more of a theoretical description, they have an emergent that is H theory description uh, at low temperature. And these are often possible platforms for topological quantum computing. So you often want to figure out how to realize them in the lab so that you could maybe play with them and realize kind of an effective topological qubit that would be protected from the environment by topology itself. And right now, these are very much like a, a famous testbed for NIST platform. And so I'll show you maybe like three examples that I found really interesting in the last few years of playing around with these theoretical ground states, trying to implement them on devices in order to test the, the validity and the efficiency of the device. One of them is with the company Quantinium on trapped ions, where they try to implement really the Tora code. This is a kind of a different form of the Kitaya model that you saw at the beginning in a specific limit. You can map it to this particular um, Hamiltonian, which has plaquettes and star operators. Um, this model of the ground state is a Z2 spin liquid, spin liquid, and the authors were able to realize using a very interesting protocol, protocol of kind of doing some gates, measuring, and then based on the measurement output, able to select whether you were going towards the real Z2 spin liquid. And they were able to prepare a Z2 spin liquid, or what seems to be a Z2 spin liquid with pretty high fidelity uh, of different kind of four body measurements. That was an interesting piece of work. Um, in Rydberg Adams, you have the Harvard MIT group that realized this dimer model on the, I think these are the bonds of the Kagome lattice. I think it's a ruby lattice or something. Um, so they place these Rydberg atoms on the bonds, and via the, the dipolar nature of the interaction between the atoms, you realize effectively a constrained dimer model, which is really a spin liquid itself, a quantum spin liquid. So this was one of the first realization of a quantum spin liquid on a quantum simulator. It was very interesting. Um, and here's another example on IBM superconducting qubits. This is in the digital mode now. These two here are in the digital mode, so they have you know, this construction with a with one single qubit and two qubit gates to implement kind of this model, whereas this is in the analog way where you realize these interactions, you evolve the system, and you measure it. In this different uh, example here, um, you have a series of gates, and effectively at the end, uh, they wanted to realize kind of this um, a, a Floquet regime that had topological bound modes at the ends, and so you could observe signatures of Majorana zero modes at the ends of the chain, right? Uh, so it was quite interesting also. And there's many, 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 many others. This is not exhaustive at all. And practically every group that does some level of, of quantum computing on devices tests on topological spin systems, topological spin liquids, and practically every company tries to also do that, right? Um, and so what I'm going to present today is a little bit like what we tried to be our little contribution to that. And sadly, we don't go into the topological spin liquids. But I think we realized a very interesting, maybe call it trivial, spin liquid. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you today. Uh, so this is a paper that we put on the archive kind of this October, but it spent from the work that I did last year as a postdoc uh, on simulating a transverse fieldizing model on the Kagome lattice um, with my advisor, Nanda Roy, and uh, a master's student, uh, Pratu Narasinam, who's finished uh, this year. Um, and so, Really, our simple model was the simple anti-paramagnetic nearest neighbor uh, easing model on the Kagome lattice. The Kagome lattice, uh, if you're not familiar, um, I think theoretically has its inspiration from this Japanese kind of basket weaving pattern, where you have these triangles here that are connected only by the vertices. So in a triangular lattice, you have triangles as the fundamental unit, but they're connected via the edges. In the Kagome lattice, you have triangles as your fundamental unit, but they're connected via the vertices. And that really enhances the frustration. There's really nowhere to go. Once you've created that little unit of, unit of frustration, which is a triangle, but there's really no way to dissipate that frustration because you're only connected to another triangle by a single uh, node, not by a full edge. And so uh, this is the, kind of the Kagome lattice here. And what we have is a transverse field, the gamma. Uh, so this is just a sigma x operator and then uh, a longitudinal field H. So this is really a model of a normal anti-paramagnetic Kagome lattice with a field that can be in any direction between the X and the Z, right? And so before I jump into maybe some of the predicting, so some of the predictions from the 
mean, let's call it late 90s, early 2000s. Um, the physics here is going to be very similar to that of the anti-chromatic transitionalizing model, same model, but under triangular lattice. So let's look at that first and see what was observed in that particular lattice. Um, because it shows a phenomenon called order by disorder, which I wanted to just kind of explain to you. Uh, it's quite interesting phenomena, and you'll see it plays a little bit of a role later on. Uh, and so, well, before I introduce the, the, the triangular lattice, why the Kagome lattice? Why was I interested in trying to you know, do quantum simulation on the Kagome lattice? Well, you saw at the beginning, I talked about this Diner model on the bonds of the Kagome lattice. There's also a lot of studies here, for example, on Rydberg atoms on the Kagome lattice themselves, and a lot of very interesting phases from disordered phases, of strike phases, some pneumatic phases, staggered, a lot of phases, and even a point here where they were able to show that this is essentially another quantum spin liquid with some string order parameter um, in the system. So there was a lot of very interesting work here done on neutral atoms, and I was like, okay, let's try to see whether we can do that, but on a different device and see whether some of these results are going to be similar. Um, essentially, the answer is no, because on neutral atoms, you have a longer tail interaction. You don't just have nearest neighbor. You have second nearest neighbor and third nearest neighbor. And you have many other kind of distance of interaction. And those are the ones that really bring you to this string order parameter. Here. So in our model, we're not going to have that. But we're going to be able to play around and see what the different phases are. So I mentioned the Ising transverse field Ising model on the triangular lattice. Um, and I'm going to show you here the phenomenon of order by disorder. The very interesting thing here is that this particular lattice model was studied using D-Wave's programmable quantum computer, D-Wave's quantum computer, just a one year or two before us. And so it really paved the way of, OK, we can do this, and we can extract some good results of this. So let me show you the results here. Uh, this was this observation of topological phenomena in a programmable lattice of 1,800 qubits where the authors essentially realize the cylinder of a triangular lattice on the device. Um, basically, what you have to do is this is the, the abstract representation of your lattice. You have to embed that on the actual architecture of the device. And then when performing different types of anneals, so these are the red points are going to be the experimental points, and they follow on this curve here. What they found is when they looked at the order parameter, they followed really well the quantum Monte Carlo results. Well, now it deviated at small and even parameter, that's large transverse field. And there was some good evidence of, there was a good understanding of why. It's because essentially the measurement in these devices um, is not kind of instantaneous. The measurement is done with a little bit of diabetic carrying of the state, and that destroys uh, whatever you might have created here and projects it to a higher kind of point. And we'll see the same results in our own uh, our own things. Yeah. Can you just quickly explain the annealing schedule that they used? Yes. Uh, you'll see later on that I'm going to go much more detail because we have very similar anneal schedule. Yeah. What they do essentially is they anneal down to that pause point here, pause there, and then quench to measure. And the reason for the quench is because in the D-Wave device, the only place you can do a measurement is when s is equal to 1. So you have to end up at s equals 1. The statement here is that we they quench fast enough, and we do the same. The quench is fast enough that you've effectively measured stuff that was at s equals 0 0.2. Now, that statement works better and better at larger s and worse and worse at smaller s, because that quench has a certain slope. You cannot make it as you know, quenched as you would like. OK? Um, so typically, it's going to be some anneal, some pause, and then the measure. Um, yeah. And so below here, you can see the theoretical phase diagram of this model, which has this phenomenon phenomena called order by disorder. What that means is that if you have no transverse field at this point here, transverse equal to zero, zero temperature, the system is disordered. Okay? This is a disordered system. Um, basically, the magnetization is going to be zero, and all other order parameters you might conceive are going to be zero in this model of just an anti-paramagnetic Ising model on the triangular atoms. Now, as soon as you put a little bit of transverse field, okay, that lifts that degeneracy between the, the really large extensive degeneracy, lifts it and selects a specific ground state. Okay. And that ground state has uh, I think Z3 or Z6 order. Okay. It's a very interesting clock phase. Um, and it melts with temperature through two different cosmetic stellar space transitions. 
And so what they were able to see is just the tip of that cluster established lobe over here. So they were not even able to be in the ordered phase here. And that was a, really a statement of um, the temperature in the device being too high. So if you were to lower the, the temperature of the device or conversely increase the interaction, the, the interaction strength uh, on, the, on the device. So right, let's say from one megahertz to 10 megahertz or something like that, you would lower this curve down and you would be able to probe even more of it, right? So this pointed to a lot of interesting things and we wanted to keep checking those things, but on a different model with a more complex phase diagram. So here they were able to tune only the transverse field. We're going to tune both the transverse field and the longitudinal field and try to see different parts of the phase diagram and validate all of these in in insights. So we're going to go back to our simple model here. So some early predictions on this from the late 90s to the early 2000s was somewhat of this phase diagram here. So as you increase the transverse field with zero longitudinal field, you have this phenomenon that's called disorder by disorder, which is very odd, but it really means that the transverse field is not able to lift any of that degeneracy. That degeneracy remains full, remains completely. And you actually go from that classical spin liquid here at, at H equals zero, gamma equals zero, to just basically signatures of it, and then eventually to a polarized phase that's kind of going to be polarized in the gamma direction. And that's pretty much it, OK? Um, as you increase the longitudinal field, you entered into a phase called the, the I school phase. So this is really similar to the spin eyes that I mentioned at the beginning. What's going to happen is you're going to force in that phase all the triangles to be in this. Well, if the field is in the up position, you're going to force all the triangles to be in the down, down, up position. So each triangle will be in the down, down, up position. But there are three choices of that. So there's still an extensive degeneracy. Now, in the late 90s and early 2000s, the thought was, as you increase the transverse field in this phase, the same phenomena as you would have for the antichromatic transverse fieldizing model on the triangular dice, that the transverse field would lift that smaller but still extensive degeneracy and select one ordered state out of these triangles. So select some order within the manifold of the spin axis. And that was the thought back then. And I'm going to tell you the punchline right now in case I never make it to the end, the end goal of my talk, but we, we never were able to observe any of that possible order by disorder phase here, and neither did our quantum Monte Carlo. And actually, we think that this, quanta, this possible order by disorder only happens in a specific kind of mode of the spin fluctuations, but that overall, the system remains disordered in the spin ice phase. So this is one interesting insight that we get from both the quantum Monte Carlo and the uh, programmable engineers. Uh, and then as you push the transverse, the, the longitudinal field even higher, you enter into a phase that's fully polarized. Every spin is in the up direction, and that's pretty boring. And so really, all of my analysis is going to be on this page over here. Um, so yeah, I mentioned this possibility of having an order by disorder within the spin ice phase that was proposed in the early 2000s. And the disorder by disorder regime over here, where the fluctuations, either thermal are or quantum, are not able to select one ground state out of all of that. So this is a very interesting point here because that really means this is a spin liquid. And you know, Premi Chandra, it was a, one of my co-advisors at Rutgers. And I remember talking to her a lot about this model. And at the time they were very excited because theoretically what they had just shown is a spin liquid, is what the whole community, Phil Anderson and you know, 20, 30 years of, of research into magnetism had was searching for is a system that would remain disordered down to the lowest temperature. They had one. Now the community has really moved into spin liquid as being a topological spin. So you would not call this really a, a spin liquid, but you would call this really a quantum paramagnet down to the lowest temperature, which, OK, it's the same, the same thing. But it doesn't have these topological features that are very exciting to the community right now. Okay, Those only happen if you have other perturbation on the on the chemical mechanics. So my, uh, my view on this is twofold. I wanted to use the known features of the model to test the D-wave quantum annealer. And reversely, I wanted to check whether the results from the quantum annealer could provide more insight on the model. And I think we've achieved both. 
So the D-Wave quantum emitter, what can you do with the D-Wave quantum emitter and how does it work? So you have this easy Hamiltonian here that's parameterized, the, and the exchange couplings are parameterized with this S parameter called the annealed fraction. Okay. What you can tell to the to the annealer, what you can send as a job is a, give, a given S of T, a given function of how S will change as a function of time. So, and by time here, I really mean in terms of microseconds. So S should be going from zero to one linearly between zero and 20 microseconds. The functions A of S and B of S are prescribed by the device. They are fixed. So the only thing you can change is when and how fast you go through these terms. But if I say I'm at S equals 0 0.2, the values of A of S and B of S are predetermined. And I cannot change one versus the other unless I have some other small parameters that I'll show you later. So these control we need is the quantum fluctuation, the sigma x here. So you start here at s equal to zero with a state with a very large a of s. So kind of the equivalent of doing a Hadamard on every single qubit. Every qubit is in the x direction. It's initialized that way. That, that field is very strong. And then you carry out, you anneal from that state, you reduce the quantum fluctuation down. And while you do that, you increase kind of the classical cost function, the classical, you know, energy. And what you can do is you can pre-specify all of the HIs and JIJs on the model on the on the device following a specified lattice. That's the one of basically the lattice that they've manufactured the qubits with, right? Uh, and so the cloud access permits you to set basically any of these JIJs to between minus one and one, or rather minus two and one, and any of the HIs between I think minus four and four. Uh, you can control the SFT. And then our challenge was basically how do we embed or put the Kagome lattice, this frustrated lattice, onto the lattice prescribed by the device. So the job in analog quantum computing or in analog quantum simulation is often the first step is I have a prescribed lattice or prescribed system and connection of interactions. How do I place that onto the hardware specification? And so here, the hardware specification were these three different annealers, the Chimera, Pegasus, and Zephyr um, lattices that each have different number of qubits per unit cell and number of couplers per qubit and numbers of qubits total. And so initially, when we started this work a, a year and a half ago, we started with the Chimera because that was the most stable um, offered device from D-Wave, although it was decommissioned about six months into our project. So, and that happened like kind of over a week. So we, you know, gladly for us, we were able to kind of switch because the, the embedding on camera was just a mess. You had to effect, like implement effective qubits using many qubits. So you have to say, that, let's say these three qubits are going to be strongly ferromagnetically bonded together so that they operate as one. And that really degraded the performance of your, of your quantum compute. So we wanted something where we had to do that, that the least possible. And very happily, the Zephyr lattice actually allowed us to implement the triangles. So the fundamental unit of the Kagome lattice and of any frustrated system, negatively. So whereas in the Kagome and Pegasus, there are no triangles natively, the minimal cycle is a square, essentially. We could do that with the Zephyr. We had less qubits to work with, but we had better performance because we didn't have to rely on these two or three qubit strong modes. Uh, so this is what actually it looks like if you plot out um, all of the qubits. So these are all the little dots are going to be the qubits of this Zephyr, and the links are going to be all of the possible couplings that you can use. And I love to do. And so it was a lot of fun to try to figure out within this where to put a Kagome lattice. Okay. And what we ended up figuring out is that from this lattice here. Hidden beneath this lattice was a checkerboard lattice, just like this. And you can make a Kagome lattice from a checkerboard lattice by just removing some of the bonds. So if you remove kind of this bond here and that bond there and this bond here and that bond there, you get a Kagome lattice. So we had a Kagome lattice. Now, we had a Kagome lattice with maybe 50 sites out of 560 qubits. That was not very efficient. So then we go back to our Sudoku playing game and we figure out, okay, we can take this and we can kind of foliate it. We can put another one on the device. 
using unused qubits. And then we can link them at the edges. And we can realize a torus, or well, not a torus, sorry, a, like a cylinder. And then we can add some other edge qubits. And so that's what you end up at the end. What you see here is our final kind of system, which is this torus of the Kagawe lattice. Um, that we can implement on the whole device. So you can take this torus, you can flatten it out, and then you can just whoop, put it there. Okay. There would possibly be more space even in the in this to implement kind of another another uh, maybe the torus itself, you know, like finish uh, the the whole torus. But uh, we were not able to, and that's pretty pretty much because you have a finite number of qubits here in this prototype. Um, to do a full torus, you would need like extra qubits that would dangle at the edge to be able to do that full connection. Okay. So, um, yeah. can you explain what the difficulty is? Why isn't every qubit um, a node in your lattice? Yeah. So, in my case, they are. In my case, every node in my lattice is a qubit. But the challenge is if you if you have a lattice that's not easily implementable or embeddable on the device, you have to use two qubits or three qubits to represent one side. And okay. that's that's where it's bad. For us, we're in a good position. So we were able to embed natively. Um, but what does it mean not easily implementable? You don't have the links? Yes. Like, let's say you wanted to do, let's say the Chicago main, but with next nearest neighbor. So you would have to link, you know, this site with that site over there. That bond does not exist in this size. And so you would have to deform, deform the way you're realizing this so that you know maybe these two qubits are actually one side, and now they can extend further out. And that is a very tricky thing. And often, this is one of the challenges of using analog quantum computers to do optimization as a general thing, or rather spin glasses. Right. In general, for optimization, you want to find the solution to an MD hard problem, which often means some all to all connected spin glass. And the problem is that quickly for larger systems, the embedding degrades because you can no longer efficiently realize an all to all connected graph into the device because you've got a finite connectivity. And that's going to be the same thing for, for it's the same thing for NIST digital devices that are kind of played with. Uh, connectivity that is just hardware implemented. Superconnecting qubits only have the connectivity they have. You can use swap gates to go all the way over there. But with this device, the more swap gates you have, the more extended you get into the coherence. So here, the similar problem is, is if, you're, if your problem, your graph is not natively implementable, you're going to spend, you might spend a lot of time just searching for the right embedding. Um, so here for this particular simulation, we're just very happy to have something that was needed and could work very well. Uh, but even if it's needed, there's problems because these are hardware devices and they have defects. And so this is the actual output of like the qubits we could work with. Some of them are missing. We couldn't use them. So we have to resort to some, you know, when a bond was absent. So so sometimes a qubit was absent. That was actually easy to, to deal with. But it's sometimes a coupler would be absent. So a coupler, you could just not say this JIJ, make it one. It's just absent. And the reality is because hardware-wise, a coupler is a, is a qubit. They use a qubit to do the coupling. And that qubit is just a defect. It doesn't work well. So you lose the coupler. And so when we had two sites that should be connected in our lattice, what we had is an automatic procedure to check whether bonds were defaulting and then kind of bypass this link by creating effective qubits. So the thing that I talked to you about, we did eventually use defective like uh, qubits like this, but we had very few of them and we had a technique to manage their effect. So that was important. Yes. Doesn't D-Wave already tell you if things are working or not? It does, but then it doesn't tell you what to do after that. Okay. So yeah, we, we asked D-Wave. Tell me which qubits work or not. But then after that, if you just kind of took that for granted and didn't do anything after that, you would have a kegomenalis with kind of a missing edge here, missing edge here, missing edge there, sure. a couple of missing edges. So we had to develop something that checked that. 
So are you saying that the information that DWA gives you is not always accurate to that run? No, it is accurate. It's just, it's, so we we don't have a specific code to go check so whether the apps advanced switch couplers are going to work in the terms. Yeah. And you have to sort of create a, an automatic procedure to take advantage of that number. Yeah, for us, because normally for D-Wave, let's say you had a, a, a random graph and you said D-Wave, embed this random graph. It knows already which ones are defective and it will just not use them. But for us, we work on the, we, we've embedded this on the ideal Zephyr lattice. And now some qubits and some bonds might not yeah. be present, right? And um, it might even be, not be stable over the course of, let's say, your experiment. Or like, in reality, it, it, all of the experiments took about two months to run. The defective couplers and spins were very stable. Like the ones that were broken at the beginning of our experiments were also broken at the end of our experiments. So we just have to run this once to check who was defective. But if you wanted to do you know, more Im important spin simulations, not important, more yeah, exhaustive spin simulations on complicated lattices, you would need to have a code that goes and checks these missing couplers that you would want to predict to, to have and fix them. But that's what our code does. Are, yeah. are the boundary conditions uh, uh, oh, yeah, there in front of Taurus, or is it a cylinder? So there, uh, the boundary conditions, what we do is we run the codes, extract magnetization and observables at the boundary, and make it so that it's effectively a cylinder. So we match. We, we, we implement effective links, but they're not present. They're just done like at a mean field way. Huh. Does that make sense? In software. In software, yeah. Yeah. And so uh, that's the same procedure that was done in the triangular analysis. So you have kind of a loop, but then you try to match the other side. Okay. Um, and so I want to first compare it to some previous studies uh, on Kango mixed and ice. So the team at D-Wave also studied uh, Kango mixed and ice. So here, what the really we're focusing on is only the zero transverse field part of the same model that I presented. So the zero transverse field section of the entire magnetic gecomedatis uh, with a launch neural field. And what they use is they use the transverse field as kind of a, a tool of quantum fluctuation to do some type of like Monte Carlo step. So you start from initial state, you do some transverse field, you come back, you have a new configuration. So you're able to sample a lot of configuration that way using the transverse field as kind of a, an effective Monte Carlo advanced in set, okay? And what they were uh, embedding is their Kegomedalis on Pegasus, so that's the second one that I showed you, making it at the middle. That's kind of currently the industrial scale, the wave one, the one I used was the prototype one. Um, and because of the lattice not having triangles as a fundamental cycle, they had to resort to uh, chains. So all of their qubits were three chains, which meant that their effective transverse field on their sites was very different from the actual transverse field you were prescribing on the qubits. Okay? So gamma here is the transverse field you prescribe using the annual schedule on the qubits themselves. But since three of them are coupled using this k here, you have an effective transverse field on the sites that is much reduced compared to the initial one. Okay? So this is, I think, one of the limitations of that approach, which we were able to circumvent because Overall, our, our sites were a single qubit. So we didn't have that kind of effect. Um, and what they found is that as you change the longitudinal field, you had different, let's call this a magnetization here, that would go from fully polarized at, the, at very large fields to a magnetism plateau of magnetism one third. That's exactly what I mentioned at the beginning, this kind of spin eye space. The magnetism is one third because every triangle is stuck in this two up, one down, or two down, one up, depending on the field. And at h equals to zero, you've got exactly a point where the magnetization is zero. And the transition is pretty abrupt between those, those two plateaus and then between the polarized states. And within the plateaus themselves, if you look at the spin structure factor, you see actually um, very interesting pinch points um, and peaks in the diffraction pattern that really tell you that there's some constrained dynamics between within the ground state itself. What I mean by that is that within the ground state of, let's say all the triangles are two up, one down, there's only so many ways that you can flip from one to the other. 
And so defects can only move really in some specific directions. And that you can see in the spin structure factor by these pinches here, by these little peaks over here. Okay. And um, you can see that a little bit more in detail here as you change the, the longitudinal field, the spin structure factor changed from this, this kind of soft feature over here, which is a signature of that, that disordered state at zero transverse field and zero longitudinal field. And then some kind of sharpening of the pinch points over here, while a very big peak develops over there. And in, this, in their case, they seem to have some type of order over here, although they didn't specify to talk about it in their paper. Um, they seem to have some specific order. And then in the, in the kind of fully polarized phase, you went back to some form like this, um, but with a very large, actually, a gamma equals to zero. OK. So let's see if we reproduce some of these results. Okay. So what am I doing on time? I'm 15 minutes out. So, okay. We'll wrap up. I'm sorry, late. Yeah. So maybe we'll wait like another 20 minutes? 15? Okay. I'll do 15 and then maybe more questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so this is our results for uh, zero transverse field. So we, here we just ran forward annuals. We never paused. We never tried to probe anything that was going on with uh, some of the transverse field. And you can see that as we plot the magnetization here, we produce the same features of as we do increase the longitudinal field. You basically kind of go from zero zero magnetization to a plateau at exactly one third, right? The, plat the, the quantization you might say quantization is very very good. The dash line is one third in the blue curve is right on top of it. And then as you increase even further, you would dip into this fully polarized phase. OK? Um, the different curves here are basically, we changed the value of the J, the interaction on the device, and did the anneals multiple times. What this really represents is, in, if you think of e to the minus J over T, we're changing J, but T on the device is fixed. So we're like changing an effective temperature, OK? And so what this really means is that as you go towards, you know, from beta equals to 1 to, to 0 0.47, we're kind of increasing the temperature by a factor of on the device. So we can see the, this sharpness here kind of disappear away, OK? And um, this phase here is really this ice rule phase. The magnetization is 1 third. It's really fixed to that. And for, uh, on top of that, kind of a parameter we call the frustration parameter which is the average of sigma i, sigma j on bonds on the lattice is really fixed to also minus one third. So what this meant is that you're really in this kind of manifold of the i schools of the, all the triangles are in this up, up, down phase. And there can be some disorder in how they orient with each other, but they're all in this up, up, down phase, okay? And so what our quest was is when we apply the transverse field on that, does it then order by disorder? Do we have some type of order within those dimers, within this ice field? Um, I'm going to pass this error mitigation. You can ask me later. Uh, and to do that, we need to probe the finite transverse field physics. So this is what I described at the beginning. What we're going to do is we're going to anneal. So we always start from zero. We're going to anneal to some pause point, so to some S, which has some finite value of J and some finite value of uh, the transverse field of gamma, that's the blue curve. We're going to anneal to there. We're going to pause there for a significant amount of time, let the system equilibrate. So I want to remind you that the devices on the wave are operated much past their coherent sign of the qubits. So really, you're in some type of exchange with the environment, and you're in a thermal, in a thermal system. So we have some finite temperature in the system, no matter what. So what we're really extracting is Kind of an ensemble of states that are at finite transverse field and finite temperature. Okay, so you're kind of going down in transverse field and in temperature. You're pausing at this point here, letting the system equilibrate, and then we're going to kind of go the rest of the way the fastest possible. That's where we're going to quench and do our measurement. So what this looks like is a protocol that would look like this, where you would anneal, pause, and then quench. Okay. And so this is really what we're trying to validate is whether this type of protocol gives also good results on the hardware, good results that are matching with Guadalajara Monte Carlo, 
on the physics at finite transverse field and some finite temperature. Okay. Um, so you can see that if you take a specific S point, um, you have this A of S and B of S, you can kind of map this directly to your, your Hammond dome. That's what we're trying to do. And so the results here um, are presented to you here the magnetization as a function of transverse field. Um, I'm just going to move my little window. So in red here is um, H equals to zero. So that's on this line over here. And as you go from red to blue, you increase the H over J. Okay. So we start from red here. It's not exactly zero, but it's very close to it. What that means is that there is some stray fields in the, in the, in the device that slightly polarize the phase. So if we were to be very like, picky, we could probably add like, a very small H to compensate it and end up at H goes to zero. But this whole field, uh, uh, all line here, you can see it changes. Nothing of it changes with respect to transverse field. That's our disorder by disorder mechanism. Nothing's happening at zero transverse field, uh, zero longitudinal field as the transverse field increases. No order, no other lifting of degeneracy. As you increase the longitudinal field, well, the magnetization, uh, the absolute magnetization increases a little bit. And then eventually here, you can see a lot of the curves end up kind of fixing each other on this dashed line. That dashed line is that one third pattern. So that's basically a lot of the curves here, which are basically all of the H over J in this region. When you go down in the transverse field, so going down in the transverse field is a very high pulse point. So it's in this end. You go towards that pattern and they all become stuck in that pattern. But as you increase the transverse field, they start to deviate either up or down from it. Okay. And then if you keep increasing further, you have pretty sharp kind of transition over here on the blue, where it goes from some, some magnetization here to oh, a big bend, and then eventually your fully polarized space. And the fully polarized space is also very stable with respect to the transverse field. OK? So let's go a little bit in detail and see what's going on here. So APQ here, this first column, is the annual pulse point schedule, the result from the programmable quantum compute. The second column here is quantum Monte Carlo, where we ran on this exact same system trying to match as well as possible the interaction strength and the regimes. And so I ordered, I placed the, the, the pause points and the gamma over J in the way that they're both going in the same direction. So this is basically a small transverse field. This is large transverse field, as you can see here. And the color, the color uh, is the same for both of them. So in red, that's again, kind of close to here. The magnetization goes from somewhat of a plateau and then it increases. So that's from here, it increases and it's being kind of altered by the uh, transverse field. And then you have all of these curves that kind of flatten out and are stuck over there. And they go up or down from it um, as the transverse field kind of lifts the magnetization from this plateau towards a higher or lower magnetization. Okay. And the quantum Monte shows you the same result. Okay. Shows you. This plateau over here, and then departing from it in different, uh, different directions. And if we look at the frustration parameter, that's what I talked at the beginning, we see that every, every data point that we have for H over J is smaller than 2. They're basically stuck on this, on this line here. They're basically, basically stuck on this, on this ice rule kind of phase. They're basically stuck to uh, always being in, in triangles that are either 2 up, 1 down, or 2 down, 1 up. In, su in such a way that the average frustration parameter is always minus one. But, but as you increase the H over J larger than two, they start to deviate from it. And quantum Monte Carlo can see something very similar, although they don't stay exactly at one third, they kind of follow the same line and then deviate from that line itself. So this is something that the annealed pulse quench fails to capture. This particular difference here, we always stay within that sign. We can't here, we're not here. And the reason for that is that in, when you do the quench, the quench is not really a full quench. You kind of carry your state a little bit. So whatever this little canting here that might, have, might occur, we can project it out. Okay, So we can lose a little bit of that. Yeah. Can you separate discrepancies that are due to finite size effects from discrepancies that are due to being I, I'd love to do that. That's a great question. We were only able to do one size on our on our on a, on a, on the annealer. So that's something that as a, somebody who works in a lot of computational physics, I want to do finite size gaming to see 
What happened to this? The, the quantum Monte Carlo was, was able to do that. So just, yeah. So uh, in our paper, we have a lot of Fourier transform enough, like Fourier analysis, and like as a function of system size. And so we can see that like this isn't due to finite size. So this is for like larger system sizes, I think, uh, which are like thirty by thirty uh, atoms or something. Well, did, did you try doing quantum Monte Carlo as the same size as the one you read? Yeah, it was the same as those. It was very, it was very, very, very static. In terms these, of, these are purely due to the schedule. Or... This different, this discrepancy here is only due to the annual schedule. Yeah, and it's really been pointing out by others. We basically add another piece of evidence to that that like the quench needs to be faster. Like when you're saying you do a quench, do a real quench. Like, and that's that's very challenging for many devices because you're usually bound by some modulation of signals, um, and so it's hard, right? But knowing Knowing where it doesn't quite work is important, and how it doesn't quite work is important. So here, and one of the statements that qualitatively you still obtain the right physics, quantitatively you got some discrepancy. Uh, and so, one of the big explanations for why you have this kind of all of them kind of collapsing on the line for h over j are smaller than two, and then departing from h over j uh, for, for, from this from this line as h over j is larger than two. It's pretty much because of you, you can just look at a single triangle and look at the energy spectrum of that single triangle. What you find is that for all of this h over j uh, between zero and four, the lowest energy state is kind of the this n equals one minus one third triangle. So all of the triangles, if they were isolated, they would be in minus one third. But the excitation from it changes for h over j smaller than two and larger than two. And really, what you have is that for h over j um, for h over j smaller than two here, the disorder like getting out of all the triangles are in this minus one third occurs by uh, having some triangles be in the plus one third. But triangles in the plus one third they're unaffected by this frustration pattern. Whereas on the other end, for h over j larger than two, the defects are magnetization equals one. Okay, and so. That actually deviates the frustration parameter. And that also explains why the magnetization goes into different directions. Because the defects in one case increase the magnetization, going from minus one third to plus one third. Whereas in the other, right, like here, the defects lower the magnetization. So go from mi minus one third to minus one. Right? So the different types of defects here um, for H over J larger or smaller. Um, and so we can also do the Fourier transform analysis like uh, previously, previously was done for the gamma equals to zero, but we can do it for using our ideal pass quench on our data at finite transverse field. Uh, for h over j equals to zero, so that's the first column, we can see that the structure factor doesn't change at all. We have a, always the same kind of diffuse pattern that's really due to these spin ice, the, the, this kind of spin ice manifold, the fact that you look basically a gas of one third and minus one third triangles all over your system. And that creates this diffuse scattering pattern. And then for uh, these two points here for h over j equals two, well, with your bare eye, you cannot see any difference. So it looks like it's the same thing, so that there's maybe nothing going on between the red point and the blue point. Um, but let's see more in detail. Um, at h over j equals two, here I'm plotting kind of cuts in the Brillouin zone of the scatter of the spin structure factor. And what you see actually is that in blue, ST equals 0 0.65, that's kind of small transverse field. And in red, it's large transverse field. And it follows the same kind of numbering here for the quantum Monte Carlo data. So in quantum Monte Carlo, you have a very sharp feature at two equals to 2K, very sharp. And it goes, it becomes you know, sharper and sharper as the transverse field increases. Okay, we see a feature, although it doesn't get as sharp, but it does increase as the transverse field is reduced. And so that's what these two curves here show is the spin structure factor at a 2K point for APQ and QMC. So in QMC, you have this very sharp decline here at a specific transverse field, whereas in, in APQ for the, the quantum computer, we do have a decline, it's just not as sharp. Okay, and there's a possibility that like, Maybe there's calibration effects that, you know, the hint that something's going on here, that maybe this could be a fully, you know, a fully, a full drop. And maybe it's something about system sizes here, you know? 
But I think what an important thing is that we, we, we saw both of these things. So we saw in both cases that there was some crossover between a low SF2K and a high SF2K regime. And that really kind of told you you were entering into this spin ice manifold. Okay. So for us, this really means that as this, the, the treasure scale increases, you're basically losing the signatures of this uh, of this spin uh, of the spin ice rules. Um, and you can see that in both cases. And so that's why I draw this blue region here now kind of softly. It's really for us in the results of the QMC and the, the APQ, it's a crossover. It's not a phase transition. This is just, well, we have some signatures that happen here that disappear over there. The magnetization has some crossover, the spin structure factor, all these different things. But we at the lowest temperature that we could go in quantum Monte Carlo, and at the lowest transverse field and temperature we could go for the quantum computer, we never saw any signs of the order. So the order by disorder that was proposed, we never could see it. So maybe it's at even lower temperature. That's entirely possible. That's always the question. Many of these experimental things as well. Your temperature is not low enough. Go lower temperature. That could very well be. But what we also have is some evidence that the order by disorder seems to happen, but in kind of a specific mode of the quant of the magnetization. So only in the transverse part of the magnetization, not in the non-general part. So there is some order by disorder happening, but it's just done on the entire system. Okay. So that means that the, the system still remains somewhat disordered, all the way to lower depth, to low temperature, and stays within this ice roll phase. Um, and so what I think is really interesting here is that we we were able to both benchmark the protocols of the D-wave device, right, by looking at some known physics. But also, I think what I what I hope is that. Eventually, it, re it makes that there's some regain of interest into the intergromantic transverse fieldizing model in the Kagome Labs. And the reason I, I want to do that, because the, most of the computational results and theoretical results was done in 2000. Even classical computers have advanced since then, and techniques have advanced. And we can probe a lot of a lot more stuff now than we did before, right? So Quantum Monte Carlo is probably more advanced than it was in, in 2000. And now we can also play with other toys using programmable quantum computers. So this is very exciting. Um, and so some of the challenges that I would point out is the need for longer qubit, coher longer qubit coherence for coherent quantum annealing, as well as faster quenches. Um, OK, in five minutes, what can we do with quantum spin systems, kind of quantum spin simulators? So this is my interest for the last, let's say, 10 months, a little bit before I arrived at the University of Chicago and at Pascal, and even before that is, OK, there's a, lot, there's a big body of work that analog quantum simulators are very performant. They get to, they get to you to very exciting, very interesting topological or non-topological or complex processes, right? Now, if I think of this as a resource, as a computational resource, what can I do with this, right? What can I shape? What kind of algorithms can I shape to get me some interesting answer at the end while using that simulation of a spin system as a resource? Okay. And that really shapes kind of the day to day job that I do right now. Um, and it's really at the core of analog quantum, uh, quantum algorithms, analog processing, where you really don't try to do like this digital architecture and digital kind of masterminding of all the digital gates. You really think of, OK, I have a bunch of qubits initializing in state, and I'm going to apply a Hamiltonian that I can change with time. So I have some time-dependent Hamiltonian, some time-dependent unitary. And, whoops. and I will evolve for some time, and I will measure it. So I can control the unitary that goes in there, and it's really expressive. I mean, this is we're talking about a big unitary of n qubits, right? So there's a lot of room to play in this. But how can, I, how can I shape this so that I find, for example, the ground state of like a very complex energy um, energy manifold and you know solve and be hard problems and that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, so in a nutshell, for uh, Rydberg atoms, you can prescribe a lattice in such a, uh, that looks a little bit like this. So in two dimensions, you can prescribe where atoms are going to be. And that will dictate the interactions between them. 
And you can also apply to them um, pulses, laser pulses. Um, in this case, you can change both the detuning and the omega, the rabbi frequency of these lasers. So this is really just a laser shining on a, on a, on a two-body system, on a zero-one. And the detuning is how detuned the frequency of your laser is to the energy of that transition. And the, the omega here is really the power of the laser, really the rabbi frequency. Okay? But effectively, when you map this into um, a two-body system, it's like a transverse field and the longitudinal field. And so for Rydberg atoms, you can control each of them, the transverse field and the longitudinal field. And you have this uh, C6 over Rij to the six interaction. That's really a dipole-dipole interaction between Rydberg atoms. Okay? And so you can, you can play with having a positive detuning forces atoms to be in the Rydberg state, while this interaction here means that closed excitations are energetically, energetically disfavored. So you're really realizing kind of an anti-phomagnetic transverse fieldizing model, and the interaction depends on the distance between atoms. And so the big question here is, OK, I have a time-dependent quantum transverse fieldizing model on our for A2D lattices. That's my resource. What can I do with it? And one of the things you can do with it is some type of graph combinatorial problems, such as the maximum independent set problem. The maximum independent set problem is on a given graph, give me the largest amount of nodes such that no two nodes are connected with each other through an edge. So for example, on this graph, any of the black nodes never connect with one another, right? Or even the red nodes. And so, uh, yeah. And so that's the maximum independent set. It is an NP hard problem. Okay. And it turns out that for unit disk graphs, so unit disk graphs are graphs such that two nodes are connected if they are within a certain radius of each other. Well, MIS problems on unit disk graph natively are natively realized on neutral atoms hardware. Okay. And that radius here is really what's called the Rydberg radius. And it's really kind of a dynamically generated a, a threshold where below that threshold in terms of uh, in spacing, the transverse field is not able to kind of put both atoms into one model. The only, inter the only state the transverse field is able to realize is 0, 1 plus 1, 0. It's a bell pair between two atoms. And so that really eff effectively realizes that when two atoms are within this Rydberg radius, the only thing that can be realized is a bell pair or really an independence constraint. I can only have 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay? And so this particular like, arrangement of atoms would lead to this graph. And then if I were to run an annealing schedule with some finite detuning, the hope is that I would end up with observ observables that would be solutions to the MIs. In reality, you, you don't have such, again, a high fidelity. You get MIS, MIS minus one, MIS minus two. So you have different defects from it. But it's quite a useful tool. And that can be a resource you can be, that can be harnessed. And one example of an application to this is antenna placement. So let's say you have different positions for antennas, right? And you want to place them all. Um, then the you don't want two antennas to be within each other, uh, within the rate, uh, uh, radius of each other, because the frequencies will be, will be, you know, in, mess up with each other. And so you would like to optimize the placement of your antennas to have the most, uh, the most antennas so that you have the most coverage, but you don't want any of these, uh, these competitions. So that's a, a typical maximum antenna problem. Okay. And I want to thank uh, a paper by the team at Curera for um, these images here. Uh, they have some really good images. And so, oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. I want this. OK. And so the recipe here for the analog algorithm that I really try to do these days is you can play with two things. You can play with the register, which is the placement of all the atoms, and the pulses, so all the schedule. Here. And this is really similar to what we did in D-Way, right? Um, I tried to specify an embedding, which is a placement of all of the atoms, and I tried to specify a schedule to give my task. In my, my case, the task was to get me samples that are a finite transverse field, finite uh, temperature, and to get you know, a, a good representation of it. But here, you could play with that to really 
perform a wide variety of tasks. And it's really unclear how many tasks you could do with that and how expressive that is. And it's really an open field. So that's mostly what I work on is trying to figure out good recipes for this to tackle some interesting optimization problems, really in the operational research kind of kind of sphere. And so on that, I'm gonna just gonna let this slide here on conclusion. Thank you so much. We started a little late. Good. Um, and really how I think it's very exciting that we have these quantum simulators that can do good simulation of spin systems. And we can use that as a tool for research in condensed matter physics. I think we're nearing the point where you could envision putting somebody on a project that simulates the spin system on an actual device rather than code up an entire Monte Carlo over, over a summer. I think we're nearing that point where those two approaches are starting to be very good, both doable, okay? Um, but also these spin systems might be a very useful resource for a computational task. And so we're slowly starting to ex experiment with that and combine that with operations research with you know, complex algorithms from you know, linear programming and, and optimization where you might obtain from it a sub-problem that is natively embeddable on the devices. Okay? And so on that, thank you so much. And I'd love to have more questions. Yes. So the question is, right now there is still some discrepancy between yeah. the quantum of the Carlo and the annealer. And the question is, so you, you're trying to get quantum computer to work better, but is it possible to put some of the deficiencies into the quantum Monte Carlo to get these curves to, to, match, to, to match such that we understand better? <laughs> I think it would because like, for example, when you do simulation of the Rydberg atom, so if you use Pascal's um, Pulsar library, you can do a, a noiseless simulation. But even the noiseless simulation is basically a, uh, so you, you basically have to construct a big state vector and you do the time evolution of a big state vector. So it is noiseless, but it's prescribed by the schedule. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, you have still some limited fidelity in preparing your state because of your limited schedule. Mm -hmm. So you would probably get, if you were to do a similar approach to the uh, our results and implement a quantum Monte Carlo that had the full trajectory as we do it, you would probably get similar results mm -hmm. because you would have that feature of having to quench not being fully quenched. The thing is the quantum Monte Carlo is an ideal vector, right? It's the perfect vector. And so to put that thing would probably slow down the Monte Carlo drastically, right? Mm -hmm. One thing I um, was, is always a bit surprising is uh, the entire data that we got from the paper took one hour of that on the XP. And the entire QMC took much longer, right? Mm -hmm. So there's also the point that like, I think the classical results that we get are on par with the QMC quantum Monte Carlo. The classical results, the final state of the anneal, and if you're okay with the fact that they are classical in the sense that they have a finite temperature, they are very, very good. The results at finite transverse field are not so much. So there's a lot of room for improvement on these devices for transverse field physics. But for classical physics, it's quite efficient. Uh, so, you, so just say like, how how can you compare like, what what the comparison between the D wave and the quantum Monte Carlo like uh, in terms of time and resources? The time uh, the D wave results took about an hour. Well, not a, not an hour consecutive, right? It's like spread over a month, but the jobs are on the average of, of the order of thirty microseconds. <laughs> why, why is it spread over months? Because we had a month of access. And over the months, we have an hour of giving you access time. So, so like, it's like a, it's like it's like you can only send so many jobs, right? Yeah. And after an hour of using the QPU, <laughs> we're cut out. Okay. And so that's at the end of the day, we only use an hour of QPU time. 
Okay, so for the result states, when I work to get that as a all of them, right? And and the points that I show you, each point is I think 20 or 20,000 shots. And each point is is done through an iterative process where you shim the couplings, you change, you calibrate. I, every point is auto calibrated through 30 iterations of a thousand shots. So there's a lot of shots, but it still takes only one hour of access. And compared to the Quantum Monte Carlo? Quantum Monte Carlo is probably a week on, a, on a, some, a week or two on some, some I have a couple, like let's say 16 cores on, on a HPC. So about this problem, do you claim that the quantum computer the classical in time, yes, quality of results, no. Yeah. Right? Like, as you can see, there's still some significant quantitative discrepancy. Qualitatively, yeah. If you just wanted to get qualitative understanding of the physics, yeah, completely blown out of the water. But for qualitative, like quantitative stuff, the real, like fixing a number, right? That you can do. Yeah. <laughs> and expressivity, the quantum mechanical can give you. A sigma x term can get a sigma x term, can only collapse in this. Yeah. Are there are common ways to get your embedding correctly. So if you have a specific lattice that you have to want to study and fitting it to the device specifications, is there a standard way other than just counting? Uh, like, are there some like known algorithms that should kind of do yeah. it for you? So let's say you have a, th th there's two differences here regular lattices versus random lattices. But by random, I mean, there is no obvious structure, like a graph, right? Um, regular lattices, you're better off just understanding the structure of your, your lattice, understanding the structure of where you're trying to embed it, and fixing that. Um, for random lattices, right, more complex lattices, um, the way I love this suite of tools to do that. And similarly, you know, Pascal is also, we, I, I'm also working on some tools like that. Just because it's an inherent part of analog computer, you have to kind of match your problem to the device's interaction. So it's always going to be kind of a, a, a thing you're going to have to do. It's a challenging problem. It's basically an NPR problem. So if you're trying to solve your NPR problem using quantum healing, maybe you say, oh, I'm getting faster. Well, you've moved the NPR problem to another. NPR. It might be easier. Uh, somebody has a hand up. Okay. Oh, thank you so much.